Can everybody see my slide? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Great. Great. Well, I entitled this uh, little presentation My Life So Far because I don't know what else to call it. So, um, and it's really going to be in three, four, possibly five acts, maybe six. I don't know. We'll see how far we get. But uh, I seem to have taken a lot of turns in my career, and I thought I'd share some of them with you. Um, so, uh, oh, one second here. I move this someplace. So my current tagline, or how I identify myself, is I am a photographer who specializes, well, I photograph gardens, plants, and the people that love them. Uh, it's a nice moniker. Hold on one second here. Uh, adjust something. Uh, oh, maybe I could just do this. Hold on. Yeah. Getting there, okay. So, you know, sometimes I have to pinch myself because I realize how lucky I am to have been able to make a living doing something that I really love. And I get to spend a lot of time in really beautiful grand estates and uh, gorgeous naturalistic landscapes and uh, even some backyard Edens that uh, people have spent years and perhaps lifetimes to create. And I get to visit these incredible spaces early in the morning or late in the afternoon when the light is pretty and it's usually empty of visitors. So most gardens are beautiful to begin with and they're really generally designed to be to delight the eye. So I really think of my job as taking something beautiful <clears throat> and making it even more beautiful by translating it through a camera and lens. And I get to meet some cool people along the way. The gardeners are just a fascinating group to me. Um, I've met all colors, all ages, all stripes. And I find them in general to be a really you know, proud but humble group of people. They're, they're proud of their work, but they're humble enough to realize they can't control everything. And I've met uh, garden designers, uh, uh, community garden organizers, uh, mushroom growers, garden authors, landscape architects, you know, people who work at public gardens and have unusual jobs. And, uh, you know, their stories can really be profound. And uh, many have found gardening to be uh, more than just a tonic for modern life. Uh, some of these people, I think they really believe that gardening is their life or has changed their life in some profound way. And they're a generous group. They really do love to share. They love to share the information, the plants, the advice. And more often than not, you know, I, I'll leave a garden carrying something. I'll be carrying a shoot or a seed or an armful of produce or an idea that'll stay with me for a very long time. So let's rewind a bit. When last I saw many of you, it was at our graduation, where I think I should have, uh, I, sh I think I should have got a haircut sometime before that. <laughs> that wasn't the fashion, though. From there, I spent four years at Penn State, yeah. eventually graduated with a BS in biology. Right. I roomed off and on with Ed Friedman, who I'm sure many of you remember. Ed was a great guy, a really lovely man who unfortunately passed away about a decade ago. And just after college, I bought a camera and took a few photography classes. And I immediately won a few contests. And so a passion for making images was really kindled. My new biology degree really didn't open up a lot of doors, but I got lucky when the uh, CETA program uh, found me a job at the Carnegie Museum. I don't know if you remember CETA, it was the Comprehensive Employment and Training Act. It was a Nixon era jobs program. It, 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 was, it, was a, it was a peach of a job for me. I was hired by the paleontology department, which was a world-class department that uh, has a long history of discoveries and research. And I was stationed in, I kid you not, the big bone room in the basement. There's a little bone room too, but I was in the big bone room. And on my first day, I was presented with a set of mastodon ribs that needed repaired. 
And they taught me how to mix buckets of plaster and epoxy to, to glue these things together. And I patched up these fragile bones and I helped to construct uh, custom cradles for their storage. And I also eventually learned how to prepare fossils for study, which was using a lot of uh, small chisels, little dental tools, tiny sandblasters to, to reveal all their secrets. And being the staff photographer or the uh, appointed staff photographer, I got to go on some interesting field trips and I was able to document some of their work. Uh, this trip took me to the uh, remote area of the Gaspé Peninsula in Quebec. And we were there to excavate a sinkhole, which is a natural depression uh, that was probably uh, 100 feet deep, where uh, animals have fallen into and trapped for thousands of years. So at the bottom of the sinkhole were bones, some big bones, but mostly some little bones. And these little bones were in a big pile, usually at the bottom of the, of the, uh, of the, of the opening. And uh, we had to just uh, scoop them up and bring them up to the, to the surface in bags. And later these, uh, these bags would reveal, you know, uh, secrets of uh, evolutionary changes amongst populations or, or, or even how populations of uh, certain uh, small mammals uh, changed over centuries. Another field trip took me to northern New Mexico, which I'm sure you know, it's a beautiful landscape. And here I was helped, uh, I helped my boss Dave Berman um, find Permian fossils. And when we would find one, we'd excavate it very carefully because the rock was very fragile typically. And we gently wrapped them in, uh, in plaster soaked burlap uh, so that they would be stabilized. And then we would cart them back to the camp. So we shared our camp with a bunch of other researchers from all over the country. And uh, the nights were often filled with uh, storytelling and beer drinking, as you can imagine. So one morning, while I was still nursing a slight hangover, I was looking for a shady spot to have a rest when I tripped over a, an extremely large bed of fossils. And that bed of fossils was large enough that they are still excavating it to this day, and it now bears my name. I had discovered Cardillo Quarry. So here's a few, here's a few amphibians and a few amphibian and reptile bones that were collected there. It was really a hoot. It was fun. And I, every time I go back to Pittsburgh, I can stop at the museum and ask them what they've found in Cardillo Quarry, and they, they give me a little tour. So in 1980, I moved to Philadelphia to be with Sue, my longtime girlfriend and uh, the woman who I eventually married. And then I found work at the Academy of Natural Sciences. Uh, it was another natural history museum, a lot smaller than the Carnegie but uh, very old, it was founded in 1812. And there I was hired to archive or to start a new archive of bird photographs with the name VIRIO, which stands for Visual Resources for Ornithology. And our aim there was to find photographs of, over, of all 9,000 bird species and all their different plumages and behavior. And so this required me to visit some of the preeminent bird photographers of the country to make photo duplicates of their prized images at their homes. So uh, here I am at Elliot Porter's home in Santa Fe. And Elliot was a, uh, was a he photographed a bird's nests with a large format camera, not an easy thing to do, but he was much more than a bird photographer. And if you look him up, he was one of the finest landscape photographers of last century and his work still inspires me. So I treasure our little exchanges we had over, over our breakfast every morning. On another occasion, I traveled with a team of ornithologists to Amazonian Peru. Now this was a, this was a trip of a lifetime. We flew into Iquitos, an old rubber town in the Amazon, and then boarded uh, an insanely crowded ferry boat. One of those ferry boats you read about in the news to tip over when they, because they have too many people. Uh, we spent 12 hours on the ferry with no, no sleep at all and eventually uh, took a smaller boat, a smaller leakier boat, I should say, to the field station, which was a pretty rough camp with minimal luxuries, but it was just teeming with life. 
So my role there was to test the new portable studio that I had constructed to photograph uh, captured tropical birds in a naturalistic setting. So birds were netted and were brought into the enclosure and then I poked a camera at the other end and, and tried to uh, take a picture that looked more like uh, they might actually be in nature using a little bit of uh, the native branches and foliage. Um, you know, I had some successes. It was just the beginning of doing this. And uh, I think if I would have stuck with it, I probably would have gotten better, but uh, it, it was a fun, fun project. But I also loved the people we ran to along the way, the, especially the, the children's faces and kids on the riverbank and uh, kids at camp just wonderful people. Um, everyone we met was incredibly generous, warm. Um, this river family lived on a platform uh, and we stopped there one night. We couldn't go any further, it was dark on our return trip. And they let us onto their platform and fed us and just were so generous with the little they have. It was just really heartwarming. So getting back home to Philadelphia, Sue and I were invited to spend a month house sitting in Nantucket. And I was trying to improve my skills as a wild bird photographer at the time. So I was, you know, investing in long lenses and getting out early in the morning. Cause I really wanted to get to, I really thought this would be my career. Well, one morning I came across a bird that was a regular visitor to a, a nearby beach and it really didn't look like uh, any of the native herons. So I was kind of confused. I asked some of the local bird watchers. Nobody seemed to know what it was. Um, they thought it might be a hybrid of some sort. So I took photos and then I returned to the museum. I showed the photos to some of my ornitholo ornithological friends. And it turns out it was the first recorded sighting of the Western reef heron in this hemisphere. So this is huge news in the birding wor world. And uh, you know, when the news broke uh, in the New York Times and the Washington Post, Birders were flocking to the island to get a glimpse of this, of this crazy bird. And it cooperated. It kind of stuck around for a couple weeks. So people would get off a plane in Nantucket. They'd grab a cab and say, take me to the bird. And <laughs> they'd, go, they'd go see the bird and they'd check it off their list. And then they'd fly back. So now having left my mark on the, on the fields of paleontology and ornithology, I decided to get out of the uh, natural history business because I didn't want to get an advanced degree. It was just uh, going to be a little too much. So I thought I'd try a different line of work. It was more about photography. And I took a job as photo editor at Organic Gardening Magazine at Rodell Press. And I found I really loved working closely with other creatives, writers and editors and designers, and to make compelling stories to tell that you know, people read all over the country. And even though I started off as a photo editor, I eventually became the director of photography, which meant I could hire other photographers and work alongside them. And I really hired some really talented shooters. It was really a great learning experience to be alongside some of these folks. Learn how they work, how they approach things, how they do business. We even did a story on Martha Stewart um, early on in her career. Um, and there's many stories to tell about that visit, but that's for another Zoom meeting. Um, and I began to photograph a lot for the magazine too. I photographed through the covers, their features, and I really began to appreciate how good words and strong images and clean design can really create stories that connect people. So after 11 years at Rodale, I decided to strike out on my own. And knowing how magazines work, I find it pretty easy to pitch stories and, and, and photos to other garden magazines. This is one of my favorites, Garden Design, which was published for about uh, six years and just folded recently, but it was a beautiful publication printed on gorgeous paper and just stunning design. And they, they had no ads and ran on subscription only. So it was, a, it, was a, it was kind of an adventurous thing to do, but it, it eventually folded. And I also photographed for books. I actually have 27 titles where I was the primary photographer. And I found commercial clients in the horticultural field. So I discovered I had a niche that I could work and I'm still working that niche. 
In 2014, things uh, got a little more interesting. I set up a partnership with three old friends, all who had magazine backgrounds. And we approached the uh, venerable Pennsylvania Horticultural Society with the idea of making over their magazine. Uh, now PHS, the Horticultural Society has a really great mission. They believe in the power of horticulture to make positive social and environmental change. They create like to, their programs, I think, are aimed more toward uh, creating healthy environments, increasing access to fresh food, expanding opportunity. Gardening for the greater good is their motto. So it's a really solid organization. They had some wonderful stories to tell and we developed this magazine Grow for them, which is a beautiful quarterly and it focuses on the, uh, on the organization's mission uh, throughout and serves many of the communities within and around Philadelphia. It's also won best garden magazine of the year three times. So it's not too shoddy for a regional garden magazine. So I wanna tell you about a couple stories um, that we featured and uh, you might find interesting. This one is from the most recent issue. Uh, the theme of this issue was diversity. <laughs> we did a story on this community garden in Philadelphia <coughs> It was created especially for Southeast Asian immigrants. Most of these folks are, are refugees. They're from Myanmar, Bhutan, China, and many had been expelled from their countries or had fled from difficult situations. And many of them came from rural areas where they were really longing for a place to farm, to put their hands in the dirt again. And they really love to garden. They garden passionately, intensively on tiny little plots in tiny little lots in, in the center of uh, in the South Philadelphia, uh, amazing uh, location for them. And I think there's a total of a hundred some plots and 150 gardeners and PHS, the organization helped them uh, get established and uh, secure the long-term use of these lots. You know, part of the problem with community gardens is that sometimes they'll start on land that appears to be abandoned and then later the uh, neighborhood becomes attractive and the owners come back and, and often push out community gardeners and PHS, PHS helps these gardeners navigate these uh, the bureaucracies that they have to deal with to, to arrange for long-term use of their land. It's, uh, so it's a really valuable organization. So that means lots of happy people here, growing community along with vegetables they can't find in stores. Here's another story that you might find interesting. It's a guy who collects Victorian glass domes with horticultural themes. John White and I had a center city house that held a, a, you know, a tiny greenhouse, but it was crammed with exotic tropical plants. And there was enough there that we could have done a story on just this, uh, just his greenhouse and his little tiny smartly designed backyard. But his inside, inside the house, he, he had a Victorian fantasy going on. And I don't think it had ever been photographed. And I was just honored to, to come in there and, 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 and document such an installation. Every inch of his wall was artfully decorated um, with beautiful objects. And he's the foremost uh, expert and collector of Victorian domes. So many of these things held um, you know, paper flower arrangements that were made hundreds of years ago. Uh, this flower arrangement was made out of wax. It still holds up. Uh, some are you know, ornamented with, with shells. And I really love to visit here. I'd really hate the dust, though. It would, it's, not, uh, it's not an easy place to walk around uh, if you're thinking about the dusting. But my favorite piece there was this little box uh, uh, that represented Eden, where Adam and Eve here are surrounded by wax fruits and vegetables. And this has to be maybe 120 years old, this piece here. Last story I'm going to tell you about that uh, was part of uh, our magazine was this one here, which was um, a program PHS runs called Roots to Reentry. And the program invites a select group of inmates to a 12-week course that teaches them um, skills, academic and vocational skills. 
So they learn about landscaping on site. They learn about carpentry by building things. They learn about urban agriculture by growing things. And then they spend half of every day in a classroom, you know, sharpening their reading skills and learning other subjects like science and math. And Anthony, who was one of the youngest ones there, he had grown and, ate, grown and eaten radishes and uh, asparagus for the first time. And he told me that they actually tasted pretty good. <laughs> They were also tasked inside with building and maintaining these little tiny hydroponic systems. And this guy, Clifton, he claimed his, uh, his hydroponic system was the best. He called it the chisel. But when I asked him about the most difficult part of the project, he got serious and he said, you know, learning to work with people I don't really like. My, my whole life I would tell a guy I didn't like to stay, I didn't like to stay away from me. But here I have to listen to the other guys in the group and let them have a say, even when I think they're wrong. So they really get to learn social skills beyond just uh, job skills. Here's Lyron who had a million dollar smile with Tim, the, pro with the program manager. Uh, Tim was affectionately nicknamed Woody because his uh, resemblance to the Toy Story character. And the program is very successful. The recidivism rate is about half the typical rate. And you know, it was especially exciting to be there on graduation day because their families are invited and some of them are having the first opportunity to speak publicly. And they got huge applause for when they go up and get their certificates. So it's just wonderful to, to just tap into a, a, a little bit of their lives and a little bit of this program. And, uh, you know, beyond learning uh, job skills and life skills, these guys, uh, they get more help as they are released. They, um, they get plugged into a network of uh, green, under, green industry uh, employers and they get assistance with the job placement and housing, et cetera. It's just really wonderful to see how people can really be turned around with, with a little help. So how much more time do I have, Bob? I, my clock is a little, a little uh, off. Yeah, I think you can go another 10 minutes. Great, okay. I'm gonna tell you about one of my favorite gardens in the world, which is Chanticleer. Chanticleer is a 30 acre Mecca of a world-class uh, display garden that I, I, I would say rivals any public garden that I've ever been to. I may be a little biased. I've done two books with them. And they're about 20 minutes from me. So it's really, you know, I, somewhat in my backyard. And it's really not your typical arboretum or public garden. It's uh, different. There are almost no ID tags. And, uh, you know, they don't have all the pines separated into the pinetum and all the witch hazels in another corner. It's all composed simply to delight the eye. In fact, the, the founder, Adolf Rosengarten, who uh, made his money in pharmaceuticals, it's been designated by him as a pleasure garden with the intention that people should leave in a better mood than when they arrived. And I really think it's the most romantic and imaginative and exciting public garden in the country. And it's not just for adults. They're, you know, uh, I mean, the kids are welcome there and they don't uh, have a kid's area either. They just, uh, they're welcome to explore the creeks and ponds and roll up and down the great lawn. And much of the garden is built around these, uh, this historic estate. Um, so it's really like contemporary horticulture in a, uh, in a historic setting. And the bones of this estate are just a perfect foil for some of these exuberant displays of horticulture. These are some gardens around the main house. Uh, this is a little porch on one end, which I think is a, a decorator's dream. Wouldn't you just love to be sitting in that chair with a book someday? And I love the way that they would float flowers every day on a simple uh, surface of a simple urn of water. All the, all the flowers that were in bloom that day, they could represent there, the entire garden. The front of the, the house has a, uh, a Japanese style raked gravel garden, which becomes incredibly transformed when uh, the cherry petals fall. 
and it has a ruins garden, which is pretty cool. Um, they were, it's right in the middle of the property. It used to be uh, the owner's house, and they tore it down, uh, thinking they were going to leave the, the the foundation, but for a number of reasons they couldn't. So they used the stone to rebuild it as a ruins, um, and it was just a it's just a wonderful, interesting space where you have both inside and outside views, and part of it features this long black table that some say looks like a sarcophagus, some people say it looks like the dining table, but it has just a, a, a thin layer of water on it that reflects the sky. It's just incredibly imaginative. It's, you know, every door, every window has plants growing in and about it, and you just get these views that can be often quite dramatic. So, you know, uh, you've also got a lot of stone uh, faces that, that are, uh, pop up under the underwater or, you know, on, there's just a lot of whimsy in this garden. And the cool thing about it is that every gardener here is assigned their own area. So they have a really wide range to come up with something really imaginative and fun and playful. And this, this little bit of competitiveness, competitiveness makes, um, keeps everybody on their toes. And during the winter months, um, all these gardeners get uh, access to a fully equipped wood and metal shop, and they've learned how to become, you know, excellent welders and wood wood car, uh, cutters and build furniture and uh, make wonderful ornamental gates and fences and rails for the garden. Uh, it's just it's like it's like a dream job for a lot of them, as you can imagine. They even made a stone sofa here with two recliners that I have to say is not very comfortable, but looks great. Or they've even uh, made their, uh, their, their restroom in the, uh, in the Asian woods uh, resemble a Japanese tea room. So you know what, I'm gonna go through some of these pictures a little uh, quicker because I don't think I have time for all of them, but I'm just gonna say it's a magical place. And if you ever get out to this part of the state, uh, try to book a few hours there. It's easy to find and it's hard to forget. And uh, it's just, you know, I've, I've mentioned, I, I teach classes there uh, on photography. And I've mentioned to people that I think you could throw your camera up in the air and come down with a good picture at Chanticleer. There's just, um, it's an amazing tapestry of, of plants and imagination and hardscape and buildings and um, uh, just a wonderful, wonderful uh, place to visit. And finally, I just want to uh, mention um, one of our classmates, Mike McCloy. Uh, this is a shout out to him. I don't know if he's on the call or not, but Mike uh, was our, uh, also graduated in 1970 and moved to DC. And he uh, was a painter, uh, accomplished painter. And he's now recently moved back to the Pittsburgh area. He's having some health problems. We wish him the best. But uh, now I'm going to turn uh, it back over to, um, to Bob and Harry. And Harry's going to make some really pretty tunes for you. So thanks, everybody. OK, uh, before we get to Harry, uh, some of you, most of our classmates from 70 should know that, uh, unfortunately, Carol Herman, who did the uh, amazing job at our 50th Zoom reunion of capturing the 60s, uh, in the speech that hopefully we have recorded, we'll put on time. Uh, unfortunately, uh, passed away last July 2nd, a couple weeks, 10 days ago at our home. And I, I Michael uh, or, or Susan, if you want to comment on that, I don't think there's a lot of information from it. And I don't sure the family has decided where to send donations. But Michael, why don't you, it's your cousin. And so why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Um, she was feeling well, but on the second, as you mentioned, she had a fall down the stairs at her home and was found by her husband, Josh, and they still don't really know, but they suspect it's complications of MS. And, um, you know, we don't have all the information available yet. It's not really finalized, but, uh, that's, that's our understanding at this point. And I suspect there will be some donation to like a... MS research organization, and we should know within a couple of days, and we'll have Bob post the information when it's available. 
Well, we have an obituary, but I will send that out later. I was waiting to see if we had information about donations and what the family would like before I sent that out. And I would like to um, work with uh, Michael, Susan, and some of the other people and, and maybe do an, a Zoom uh, remembrance of her sometime uh, in the near future. But let's just take about uh, 30 seconds for a moment of silence for Carol. Okay, thank you, everybody. Uh, we're going to go into our uh, show here with our spotlight with Harry. And I'm going to um, ask Harry some questions, and then he's going to talk a little bit, and then we're going to go back and forth with him playing. So I will move uh, forward to Harry. Let's start with your time right after high school. You graduated a year ahead of us, 69. So go ahead, why don't uh, you? You help us out here and tell us a little bit about your time. Well, I'm going to be 70 July 19th, so I'm a year older than most of the folks watching. And after high school, I played around time for a while, and then I decided uh, to take a trip south of the border and travel to Mexico and Central America for about six months and got absorbed in the Latin music and the, the rhythms that I heard. And I love that. And um, I studied at Duquesne University with the late Dr. Lewis Pollock, who was a wonderful classical pianist. And he basically helped me to hone my technique, tech, uh, pianistically speaking. And I studied composition with the late uh, Joseph Jenkins. And it, it, I embarked on a, a journey to create beautiful music and i've always tried to find melodies that are memorable in, in my in my compositions and i've learned that uh, i end up removing more notes than i compose and in, in trying to minimalize it so that the melody is something that sticks with you long after you've heard it because uh, i believe that's the essence of music it starts with a great melody. And um, during, uh, when I came back from, from Mexico, actually I was living with my brother Rob at the time. And this is a composition that I wrote when we were living together. I, I was coming home on a Sunday morning from the grocery store with a sack full of eggs and bacon and whatnot. And I hadn't, I walked past a, a, a black Methodist church and they were singing. And I was so inspired, I just put the groceries down and sat in the steps and listened. And when I got home, I wrote this and I call it the milk of human kindness. Now I should tell you that the song has a verse to it and the verse came actually about 10 years later, but I'm gonna play it with the verse. Thank you. 
the milk of human kindness. Okay, and did you have another one from that period, Harry? Um, or, uh, yeah, this was, this was actually written right after I got back from um, Central America. And I, on the way home, we stopped at a place in Mexico called Puerto Escondido. And at the time, this is going back to like mid 70s, it was a sleepy little beach town and uh, it was just so beautiful. I mean, no automobiles. It was just a wonderful place. So it was originally called Puerto Escondido, but I changed the title of it to Puerto Fortuna. And it goes like this. Okay. Harry, tell us about your time in Pittsburgh here at the Crawford Grill. Uh, the Crawford Grill, man, it was a one of a kind place. I don't know if any of you had the opportunity when it was up and running to go there, but it was a, a place that had so much, it was so steeped in the history of jazz in this town. There all the great luminaries that, that came through town in the heyday of jazz music when after, you know, people did concerts or whatever, they would also have club club dates and the Crawford Grill, you had people like John Coltrane, Thelonious Monk, grace the, the bandstand. And I always wanted to play there. They used to sneak me in when I was underage, you know, and I would off, often be the only white face there, but I got to hear this music that live and it just like, it grabbed me so hard. And, um, I can remember that the first time I played there, I was with Roger Humphreys and Nelson Harrison and some other great Pittsburgh jazz musicians. And uh, Nelson, who was leading the group at that time, he said to me, he said, he said, Harry, he says, how come you always play with your eyes closed? And I thought about it and I realized that the reason was, was on Friday nights, it was all the working girls that worked up in the Hill District would come into the grill and they would stand at the end of the bandstand looking at you saying, who are you looking so good for, white boy? And I was so scared of that, I just closed my eyes and I learned how to play with my eyes closed. It was it was much easier for me. <laughs> so Harry, tell us how you got that first gig we well, had to do was, to get, get to play I, there. Yeah, when I worked there with Nelson and Roger, that was I wasn't the leader. But after working there with a number of other people being the leader, I decided I wanted to take my own uh, quartet in. At the time, I had a group called Matrix. And we had done like warm up for a weather report and Roland Kirk and 
some of the players, well, H.B. Uh, Bennett, he was a, a great drummer. He's passed away. And the saxophone player, Eric Leeds, went on to play with Prince. But in any event, I had a cassette audition tape that we had made. And I can, tried to call the grill and, and speak to the owner, who at that time was Buzzy Robinson Jr. And I had no luck. So I found out where the man lived. And I took the cassette tape. And I figured, well, you know, if you own a bar, you're going to probably be rolling out of there sometime after two. So I went up about one and I sat on his porch and about a quarter to three in the morning, he sure enough shows up. And I said, Mr. Robinson, he said, what do you want, white boy? And I said, I want to play at the grill. And I gave him the cassette. He says, you got a lot of nerve. And I left. Sure enough, the next day he called me and I got the, the job at the grill. And uh, it was it was a wonderful place that the, the audience was it was a neighborhood audience, but you had people that really listened and got into the music. And it really inspires musicians when people get behind it, get behind the music. I think you're going to play, I think you're going to play Sloppy Seconds now. Are you ready? Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, this, the title on this one needs to be explained a little bit. Um, uh, in music, as someone who studied music at all would know, we have things intervals, seconds, third, fourth, fifth. Anyway, this one's built on the interval of a second. And I call it sloppy seconds. And it goes like this. sloppy seconds thank you <laughs> hey let's talk next about the uh encore hurricane lounge and Lou's bar well that's now i have my own uh quintet and sometimes even sextet which is six pieces and uh the encore was in shady side and it was another mecca for jazz i, I met in uh alma jamal there for the first time and you know, I heard uh, Ray Bryant, another great jazz pianist, and it, it was a, it was a great place. They had jazz seven nights a week, and I worked with a great bass player named Dave LaRocca, who now lives up in Erie, PA, and uh, a guitarist named Carrie Denegris, who now works with Chico Hamilton up in New York. And Roger was in the band for a while, Roger Humphreys, and. We just had a great time. And another a, a tenor saxophone player named George Green, who has since retired, but George was wonderful. And that was a, a, a great time because I was working seven nights a week. And there's no better way to improve your skills as a musician than to be performing. And this is a song that I wrote during that time. And it is another thing that originally had another title but I call it Swing in the Eight, and it's basically a B-flat blues, and it goes something like this.
just a little bit down the street, I believe, to this phase of your uh, existence, which many of us in Pittsburgh are fully aware of and, and participated. So why don't you tell us about the Club Cafe? Oh, uh, that was one of the biggest learning experiences of my life. I mean, playing music is one thing, you know, writing, music, composing, performing, teaching. Uh, that, that, that was, is and still, it was and is still my life. But the Club Cafe was uh, something different because it was also a business. And I learned a lot about the music business and hiring people. We were fortunate enough to bring in a lot of jazz luminaries, internationally known people. And my father and I had both of our Steinway's pianos there. And we worked up a duo piano arrangements of a lot of jazz chestnuts and some of my original things as well. And it was way ahead of its time. I mean, like, you know, most clubs today don't even have a, a decent instrument in them as far as a piano goes. This one had two beautiful Steinway Model M's. And during this time, the Club Cafe opened up about a year after my, my mother, Mary Ann, passed away. And in memory of my mother and my father, I wrote this song. It's called The Waltz for Mimi and Bob. some time about the crescendo here. You were talking about and, that. Well, the crescendo, I don't, I don't know if any of the people out there would know or remember it, but the crescendo was an after-hours club back in the days when alcohol was 
more readily dispensed after 2 a.m. And it was on the, the dead end side of uh, Melwood Avenue. Um, and it was owned by Harold Betters, the veteran trombone player from Pittsburgh, who I worked with for years. It was owned by his brother, uh, Jerry Betters, who was, who was a great drummer and just a good heart. And the great thing about the crescendo was, is that after we were all finished playing our, our engagements or gigs, we would gather there and, you know, play music all night. And uh, one night I came in and Jerry and I were close friends and I, I got there early and he said, hey, Harry, go downstairs. B wants to meet you. And I had no idea what he was talking about. So I went downstairs and there was no one down there. I went into the men's room and there was a tall black figure with his back towards me, you know, and uh, I, he turned around and it was Billy Eckstein. He says, you the piano player? And I said, yes, sir. And he says, okay, we're going to do Sophisticated Lady in A-flat. And I said, yes, sir. But so I got a chance to work with Billy for about a week, you know, at the crescendo. And it was wonderful, man, because the man had such a command of his voice, but he also, the ladies loved him. He was, he was a star. And uh, it, was, it was my honor and privilege to play behind him. And I learned so much about the art of accompaniment. As a pianist, when you back a vocalist, I'd like to think of a vocalist as the gem. And all the instrumentation behind the gem, wants, you don't want to outshine the sparkle or the clarity of the gem. So you have to just be the perfect setting for the gem. And Billy Eckstein helped me to learn how to do that. And I pride myself on giving good accompaniment a great vocalist and i've worked with some great vocalists so yeah i think you also had some other people you mentioned stanley turrentine oh yeah stanley turrentine popped in there one night and we played you know like uh, a couple of sets he, he he stanley turrentine is a native pittsburgh tenor saxophone player who had a very unique sound and style and i mean when you hear hear him play this horn it's immediately recognizable as stanley sound and we're, we're playing music with him on the same bandstand. It was it was wonderful. It was amazing. And I also uh, met uh, a, a saxophone player who's passed away. His name is was Arnie Lawrence. He was a New York player. He played with Blood, Sweat, and Tears and uh, Benny Goodman. And uh, Arnie and I became friends. And uh, I actually worked with Arnie for a couple of months. And then I, when we had Cardillo's Cafe, I was fortunate enough to bring him in to work there as well. And he later re, re, uh, retired, went to Israel to live on a kibbutz. <laughs> and he passed away. But he was a, a, a great teacher and a great player. And then I also at the Crescendo, I worked with a, a, a great jazz vibraphonist named Roy Ayers. And they were all just, it was all wonderful because the setting was so relaxed. I mean, here were all these guys. We finished our gigs, you know. We got, you know, uh, uh, our, our stuff packed up. The guys that had to pack up their drums or their horns or whatever. All I had to do was take my fingers. And I would go over there. And I, as I recall, the piano wasn't that good of a piano, but it didn't matter because it was the spirits that sh I shared the stage with. And I was, I was blessed to have that experience. You know, that the crescendo has long since crumbled, and I don't know what's there. It's probably a Porsche dealership or something like that. But um, I don't know. Uh, I think you well, said you had a song from there. Is that Out of the Ordinary? Is that the one okay, that time yeah, period? Out of the Ordinary, yeah. Out of the Ordinary was written in reverence to great teachers that I've had that have passed away, because to me, they were all out of the ordinary. And it's a ballad. And it's, musically speaking, it's interesting because it, in, in music, a cadence is how a phrase ends. And uh, the ending cadences on each portion of the song are of interest. So this is out of the ordinary verse.
That's out of the ordinary. Okay, then tell us, you went down to Washington, D.C. and lived there for all. Tell us about, all about that. Well, um, I left the club about in 1994. My father stayed on for another year, but I just wanted to try something new. So um, another former Pittsburgher named Tim Ironman, I don't know if anybody would remember him. Tim was an alto saxophone player, actually multi-woodwind player. He had a successful touring group called uh, the East Coast Offering. And I told him I was thinking about moving to DC. So he said, yeah, come on down, I'll help you out. And he did. And I went down there and worked with, with Tim, you know, playing around with, with the quartet. And the other nice thing about DC, and it's still to this day, it's true, as well as other, you know, great cosmopolitan towns, most of the great hotels have pianists in them. And, you know, in DC, some of the the hotels had great pianos in them as well. So I was uh, looking to get a job to supplement my income, you know, playing in the hotel. And the Hay Adams Hotel, which is right across from the White House, uh, was looking for a pianist. And I, I remember I showed up late for the audition. There was like 30 other people in front of me. And I thought, oh, I'm never going to get this gig. I was like the last one to audition. But as soon as I was done, the person hiring says, the job is yours. So it was seven nights a week, which was a, a lot to play because I was also doing, you know, work with Ironman. But I took it and they had a lovely Steinway Grand. And it was a, a, a very interesting thing for me because a lot of political people would, you know, pop in to sit, whether it was at tea time or for a cocktail or whatever. And it would not be uncommon for me while I was playing. If I turned my head around, I'd see like Hillary Clinton or Bob Dole or, you know, uh, another prominent Washingtonian. And one night I was playing and a gentleman came up to me after I was done playing and he said, um, would you be interested in playing a, a private party for Senator Kennedy? And I said, sure. So um, I was given a number to call and I called and I didn't speak with, with, with Ted Kennedy, but I spoke with someone that told me where he lived and I showed up and he had a beautiful Steinway. Ended up like I played, you know, about a half a dozen parties for him and he was just a great guy. He always, he, it's so charismatic and, uh, and a music lover as well. And uh, I enjoyed playing for him. And I enjoyed my time in DC. Um, but uh, it's a tough place because it's so transient. Like uh, I, when I first lived, lived down there, I had a, a big loft that was about three quarters of a mile from the White House and the Hay Adams Hotel, which was great. And then later on, I moved into a house in Chevy Chase. And I think the three years that I was in Chevy Chase, my neighbors on each side changed three times. So you just get to know somebody and then they're gone. <laughs> but it was it was a good experience for me. I really enjoyed being in D.C. And I still have a lot of good friends and musicians down there. And Rob and I still have family in, in the uh, D.C. metro area. I think the song you had from there was Hope. You want to play that one for us? Well, Hope has got an interesting story to it. One of my dearest friends who was, uh, we went to music school together and he moved to the West Coast years ago and we still get together and we're currently working on a, a, a recording project. His name is Francis Vanek. And as far as I'm concerned, he's probably one of the greatest tenor saxophone players in the world. And uh, he had a son who was an autistic child. And uh, at about the age of 13, as Francis told me, he said his son came to him one day and said, I don't think I'm gonna be, a, a, you know, I'm not long for this world. And apparently shortly after that, the child committed suicide and his name was Arlen. And so I decided that I had to write something for Arlen Vanek and this is called Hope.
let's uh, move on to um, working with your dad again on this project, the Hands Together project. And uh, you're going to play in a trance when you're done talking about that. So tell us about that. Well, like I say, that was a, an interesting time in my life because my father, who was my first teacher and also piano teacher to probably many of the people listening were, who had friends to study with my father. And he was a great musician, um, extremely well-rounded and extreme, extremely well-schooled. And, you know, uh, he, he taught me the basics of music. I mean, I studied with him until I was 13 years old. Then I found girls and I decided I didn't want to study piano anymore. But the, my father and I, we always had a, a, a unique relationship. Uh, it was like we, sometimes we would fight like cats and dogs. But the thing is, is we were usually able to come on to, to, to a common ground when it came to music. So we worked on a lot of uh, two piano arrangements of things. And it was the first time I had showed my compositions to my dad before, but they, I guess they didn't stick. But during this time, he started taking a notice of my compositions. And this is one that I wrote that I remember he had some difficulty with at first, but we worked it out. This is called In a Trance. <laughs> a little about your teaching and things that you're doing now. Okay, well, when I first started teaching, I didn't think I was going to like it at all. <laughs> I've grown to love it. And I tell my better students that what I don't tell my beginning students, that, and that is that the better the student is, the more I learn from them. And teaching to me has become a, a, a great tool in self-growth because my need to express or to direct a, t a student to, to, to be able to accomplish something, I have to search inside my head to figure out how to get through to them. And each one is unique. Um, things that I know inherently or I've learned so long ago that I don't think about how I do them, I have to figure out how I'm going to get through to somebody that has never had any training at all. And that's always been a challenge that I love to do and to hear like you know some of my students like having great success later on 
and and thanking me for their training. It's it's a great it's it's a great gift to get from them. And um, this is a, a song that I wrote for my wife, um, and it's called Deb Song. One word: D E B S O N G. And I think of it as sort of like a like a, a almost a folk song. It's very simple, but I think it's beautiful. <laughs> Okay, so tell us about this. Who went to Peabody, Eric? So tell us what you did for this session. All right, here. well, when Bob called me to do this thing, you know, I mean, I was sort of surprised because I'm not in the same graduating class as my brother Rob, but um, I thought Peabody, and boy, I was flooded with memories, both good and bad. <laughs> but I thought, you know what? I'm going to write a song for Peabody. So this is just, it's like, it's like a jingle almost. I call it, Who Went to Peabody? And... What I'd like you all to do, if you like it, you, you can have a contest and write lyrics for it. Maybe, you know, maybe it'll turn into something that, like, you know, 100 years from now, someone will still be singing. But it's really simple. And it's I'm going to play it just as simply as I can so you can all hear the melody. get the idea. <laughs> Anybody who's interested try to put some lyrics to it is more than welcome to get in touch with me and I can supply you with a lead sheet or if you you know want I'll re-record it for you. <laughs> but hey. I, we, could, we could also say you know besides who went to Peabody, we went to Peabody, she went to Peabody, you know I mean it could go a lot of different ways. <laughs> okay I think our last song of the night that uh we're going to talk about, I think you wanted to end with Down the Rabbit Hole, right, Harry? Yeah, this is one of my latest compositions inspired by Lewis Carroll, uh, Alice in Wonder. This is called Down the Rabbit Hole. And I'm going to be 
premiering this. Well, actually, tonight you'll get a chance to hear it, but I'm going to be doing a concert this coming Friday, the 16th. It's going to be uh, the first, I hope, in a series of concerts um, for a thing I'm starting called the Pittsburgh Jazz Co-op. And the first concert is going to be at the Squirrel Hill Christian Church, which is at 290 Bigelow Street. It's actually a Hazelwood zip code, but it's very close to Greenfield and the High Level Bridge. And I'm going to have uh, the great vocalist Michelle Benson will be singing, uh, the incredible multi-wind player Lou Schreiber, and my trio with Mike Coolis on string bass and Richie Scampone on drums. And uh, tickets are $20 in advance, $25 at the door. It starts at 7. We're going to be doing at least four of my compositions. And Michelle is going to be doing some uh, wonderful Johnny Mandel tunes. And Lou, I don't know if you've, Lou is another Pittsburgh institution. The, the man was born blind and he plays every woodwind instrument and the piano and organ and tunes pianos. And uh, he was on the Fred Rogers show a number of times. But anyway, Lou has been a, a, a great friend of mine. He and another non-sighted saxophone player by the name of Eric Kloss, who is also a world-known talent, the two of them went to school together at the School for the Blind. And when I was 16 years old, going to Peabody, I was in a band called Salt and Pepper. I, for a while, I was the only salt. But we were like a rhythm and blues band, and, and we played the School for the Blind uh, Sadie Hawkins dance. And the director of the school said, I have two students here that would like to sit in with the group. Is that all right? I said, sure. And out comes, unknown to me who they were, Eric Kloss and uh, Lou Schreiber. And let me tell you, that was alto madness. I mean, I never heard saxophones played like that in my life. And Lou and I became fast friends, and I, I love the man, and I want to honor him, as well as a memory of my father. And every musician on the on the bandstand this coming Friday night will have, uh, have played with my father at one time. That's how I uh, part of the reason I chose him because they all had made music with my father. Anyway, this one's called Down the Rabbit Hole. And once again, I could get into like how this song developed, but it basically goes like this. If you want to hear extended versions of all these tunes, you got to come to the concert. <laughs> okay, so uh, I want to thank Harry and Rob, and we can open it up for any questions or comments. Uh, we still have a few, little bit minute. Obviously, if we if people have to drop off and leave, that's fine. But we can we can hang around. So uh, anybody who wants to unmute, go ahead and uh, make a comment or question. Say, Bob, uh, th this is uh, Gary Melnick. I had a, a question for Rob. Uh, uh, his photography uh, focuses on places of such beauty, and I'm wondering if he's uh, taken his talents abroad. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, the Tulip Gardens in the Netherlands. Uh, I think it's called Kirchenhof, and, of course, a, a multitude of incredible... Japanese gardens, uh, primarily in Kyoto, uh, as just two examples, I'm sure, among many. Go ahead, Rob. 
Hey, uh, thanks, Gary. Yeah, I've, I've traveled a bit abroad. I've been to Japan twice and, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've sort of uh, off season. I haven't been able to hit the gardens of Kyoto at the right times, which is, I think, the fall and, and the cherry festivals in the spring. But um, uh, they're incredibly, incredibly beautiful. And it's amazing what people can do with just moss, rock and, uh, and water. You know, they can just construct these incredibly uh, beautiful and ancient gardens that um, um, are just remarkable. And I've been to Kuchenhof in Holland uh, twice. Uh, it's, it's, it's a gorgeous place. I was over there with the, the, uh, the Tulip Bulb Information Center. They, they brought me over um, and I got to photograph a lot of, uh, a lot of interesting uh, operations there too. They, they, they sell more cut flowers than anybody else in the world uh, in Holland. And um, some of their operations are incredible, but, but Kuchenhofen and also a great place I visited once, which is a, um, the name is drawing a blank right now, but it's a bulb uh, museum where they actually just grow historic tulip bulbs uh, in this little churchyard. And it's just fantastic. Um, so it's, it's a great, the great places and um, would love to return. L lastly, uh, and then I'll shut up. Uh, I was curious in this um, uh, park that you highlighted toward the end of your talk, Chanticleer, mm -hmm. yep. uh, is there a um, quote unquote best time of the year to visit there uh, yeah. if one wants to soak in all of the colors that uh, oh, yeah. you brilliantly showed? Rob was really good too. Boy, that, that's that's a that's a hard uh, question, but you know, it, it really I think shines uh, sort of like many gardens in our uh, in our area do, like sort of uh, you know May and June. But I have to say that fall is really my favorite season there, um, especially mid late October when the leaves are turning. They have a lot of plants that just you know uh, just bounce beautifully off all that fall foliage. And it's just, it's a really, and it's not as heavily visited at that time of year either. So I find that like one of the better times to go. Thanks. Anyone else want to ask a question or make a comment? Just um, start this talking. This is Pam. Jan yeah. Doug, Pam. Then oh, Janice. So, okay. so, Pam, um, you're first. All right. So Rob, your artwork is stunning. It's just beautiful. And Harry, I had a question for you. My, um, she was great on Bertie Dunlap owned the hurricane. I wonder if you have a hurricane story. No. No stories. Did you, you play there or no? Where? The hurricane. Oh yeah, the hurricane, yeah. yeah. I, I, that was a, an amazing place. It was, they had a lot of great jazz organ in there, but um, I, I worked there as well with Roger Humphreys and, and Nelson, I think. Mm. And <clears throat> I miss places like that because <clears throat> They were meccas, and um, I don't know if you know it, Pam, but um, uh, Franco Harris and a group of people are looking to reopen the Crawford Grill. And I, uh, yeah, I know there have been a couple of efforts for that. Yeah, but he's yeah. his looks very serious. Um, I'm going to be doing mm -hmm. an interview with him uh, later this summer about that, and um, mm -hmm. just sharing my experiences there. And I hope it it, it happens because it'd be great to get good music back up on the hill again. Right. Well, well it, it actually played an important role, both, both the hurricane and Crawford drill, an important role in African-American history because like Bertie, who was my great, great aunt, would um, tell Wait, stories Bertie? about Did you say Bertie? Bertie, Bertie Dunlap. She was the Who owner. Lived above the grill? No, not the grill, the hurricane. The hur I remember her. Okay. I do remember her. Yeah. yeah. I do, I, now I remember her. Yeah. She was Devoted to, to the music too. I mean, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Ah, you're, that's your, how you related. A great aunt. That's amazing. Like, yeah, yeah. But she, um, she would tell stories about how when they they would the musicians would go and play these society parties down at, at most especially the William Penn. Yeah. But they'd have to go through the kitchen and they couldn't stay there and everything. And so they would do that and they would go up to her place and and, and jam all night as just yeah. as you about yeah, yeah. I, I, I remember uh, I didn't hear it directly from her but someone was telling me that was speaking with her and she said the, the one drummer she always knew was Art Blakey she said 
man, nobody could play like him, you know. But uh, right, Bernie Ranch. I, I know what she's talking about, the William Penn. I was a house pianist there for eight years. And even mm -hmm. though I worked there for eight years, I still had to come in through the side door and, you know, use the employee's cafeteria. I mean, it just that's the nature of the beast, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for sharing your part, both of you. you. Harry, Harry, uh, Michael Menard here. Um, I know you worked with Roger Humphreys. Did you, were you familiar with uh, his uncles, uh, Hildred Humphreys and, uh, and uh, Fat Man Humphreys, who both played in the Count Basie Orchestra? No, but um, I worked with his brother, Johnny Humphreys. I don't know if you know him. He was a vocalist and uh, Johnny and I worked uh, as a duo this was, I, uh, there, there were a number of clubs out in the Monroeville area. Uh, uh, during the 70s, I mean, there were clubs everywhere. But I worked with Johnny, and he was a character, man. And uh, uh, Roger used to have a club on the north side at one time. It was called Manteca, and, uh, which means Greece in Spanish, Manteca, or, you know. But um, Johnny would come in often and just impromptu sit in, you know, and it was always a pleasure to work with him. But the, they, the Humphreys really were, uh, you know, a family of, you know, musical royalty. And Roger, and Roger really is, I guess, at the very tippy top of that right now. But his uh, one of his cousins is up, lives up my way. His name is Frank Diaz, and I do a lot of work with him. But um, it's a it's a great family. I mean, you know. yeah, Roger's he's the godfather of jazz in this town. Yeah, you know, and I mean, I, I don't know whether most people know it or not, but he has two artificial hips now, and he's in his 80s, and he's still swinging his ass off. So I mean, yeah, Roger, I was I was so fortunate at a young age to work with him, man. You know, I mean, it was like he didn't he didn't take any BS. I mean, you know, it was all about the music, and uh, I learned a lot from working with him. I think Janice Cohen had a question or comment. Yeah, uh, two things. Uh, Rob, first, I loved all your uh, photographs. They're just really beautiful in, the, in their whole story. And I, want, I wanted to know where that garden is, the one that you highlighted. Where is it physically located? Yeah, the garden I talked about at the end is, is Chanticleer. And it's uh, in Wayne, Pennsylvania, which is just west of uh, the Philadelphia. It's uh, on the main line. And it's... Um, it's uh, only been open to the public since uh, the late 90s. So, and it's actually still uh, unfamiliar to a lot of people uh, in the region. And it's really, uh, they're lost because it's, it's really, it's, 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 it's the most beautiful place on earth as far as I'm concerned. So. <laughs> Great. My second question was, after seeing those photographs and hearing Harry's first couple of uh, pieces that he played, have you guys ever considered combining <laughs> your photographs and his music uh, as a theme for something? I think we tried a, a couple things some years ago and uh, yeah, they were pretty nice, I thought. And uh, I think we, we should probably do that again. Yeah, we're due for a project together. Yes, yeah. we are, yep. <laughs> that would be great. Okay. I really enjoyed your music too, Harry. Thank you. Okay, anyone else want to make a comment or a question? Just uh, unmute yourself and start talking. Michael, you had something else. Go ahead. Well, Rob, that was, you know, beautiful, beautiful work. I was just wondering if, if you had any Martha Stewart story. <laughs> <laughs> you, allu you alluded well, to the fact that you did. Yeah. But, um, well... I, I guess it's a safe audience here. It won't go any further than this, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's in the vault, right? We're going to record it, it and put it on YouTube. Here, but <laughs> well, right, it's going on I'm YouTube. off the recording, okay? <laughs> but, uh, you know, I mean, we, we, we visited her and uh, it was for to stage uh, a party shoot. And it was supposed to be her, um, her daughter Alexis's 21st birthday party. <laughs> And uh, her daughter was having none of it and actually didn't show up and none of her friends showed up. And so we had to stage the party with, you know, just pulling people practically off the street, the crew, the, you know, the, the photographer, assistant, the grip, 
know, we've got sports coats and put them in the background. And <laughs> it was just really so, uh, you know, silly. And um, I remember the one thing I, I said, you know, I wonder how long it will take the, the, the doyen of hostess scene to, to, um, to offer us a beverage when we <laughs> first showed up. I just thought, you know, it'd be an interesting thing to see how long it would take for somebody to say, oh, would you like a drink of water or here's the restrooms? And it didn't happen for an hour and 15 minutes. So I thought, okay. But, but I mean, she's, she's an incredibly talented person and, you know, she, and, and she knows how to hire an incredibly talented staff. And, uh, and, you know, we've since bumped into each other a few times uh, over the, over the years. And uh, I, I have nothing but admiration for her. She's really a, a terrific, terrific creative genius in that, that respect. Okay. I'd like to. That's all, that's all I'm saying. If there's a, if there's time. Karen, go ahead. Um, yeah. Um, to follow up on what, on Jan, what Janice asked, um, and I know, um, Rob, you know about Grounds for Sculpture oh, that yeah. was founded by Seward Johnson. And he passed away last year in the midst of COVID. Didn't know. And we had a celebration of his life um, just last month. And um, they had a jazz ensemble that was absolutely fantastic, hmm. um, plus a vocalist. And 10 of his sculptures were, they, they actually did original pieces, wrote them and performed them for 10 of his sculptures. Wow. Wow. And it was powerful. It's on a video. And if you'd like, I can, I, I'd, I'd be happy to um, arrange to share it with you. I'd, I'd like it was a phenomenal night. They had this amazing tent. Well, you can just imagine. Yes. Um, they had to do everything at the, you know, at the top. Everything was was perfect. But the performances were amazing, and they had a story for each of the sculptures. And what happened was is that in 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 his last years, um, the members of the jazz ensemble had visited and walked around. And um, they also and 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 they they were inspired. They chose the art that they wanted to write about, oh. and then the performances. It was jazz, and they two of the pieces were were blues. Some of them were just instrumental, and some of them actually had lyrics. Oh. And they were just amazing. Oh, I'd like to see. I'd like to see that very much. I, I, yeah, I, I, I I'm happy to share it with both of you. And yeah. I'm going to give a plug to um, Grounds for Sculpture too. That's thank probably, you. The second favorite garden of mine in the East Coast. If you've never been there, that is well worth a visit. It's 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 combining modern art, modern sculpture, and I might not get this right, Terry. You tell me, with incredible landscape design, and everything is spaced very nicely and appropriately. Big place. You just turn the corner and you see some far out sculpture with you know just this great horticulture around it. It's it's a fabulous visit. Uh, in the there. middle of an industrial area in Hamilton, yeah. near the train station, right. and it's yes, it's this oasis, a miraculous, gorgeous, magical oasis. It is, and it's my second home. I'll be there twice on Thursday for lunch yeah. and for dinner with different groups. But uh, yeah, and I serve on the board of trustees. But I love the place, and it's. Um, I thank you. You did a great job of describing it, but really uh, seeing it and visiting and almost all seasons because it is open all year. Yep. Even in the winter time, it's interesting. They have a warming hut. Yeah, I remember. But you mentioned how perfect it was. Seward Johnson had a hand in all of that. He really wanted all the, you know, the plant, the right plants and everything positioned the right way. But um, it's definitely worth worth a visit. So, but Chanticleer sounds fabulous. I really want to. I've never been, and I really oh. want to. So thank you. Okay, anyone else have a question or comment? Okay, so then we'll we'll conclude. I'm gonna ask Larry Warshmel just to talk for a couple of minutes how we're working on the YouTube channel and and uh, that's hopefully and how far along that is, but we should be launching that soon. Go ahead, Larry, you're somewhere, can't see you, but you're here. Yeah, I see you, go ahead, Larry. <laughs> So, well, the channel's up there, uh, available. Do we want to make it, like, make an, an announcement to everybody when we think it's got enough content? Send out an email? Yes, that's what we're going to do. I'm hoping to get okay. 
this up and i don't know if pam if you said if you've got pam's yeah pam's is up now with the description she gave me and we'll get the nights up okay so when we after we get tonight so i'll send up an email with the link and all but it's going to be a peabody channel not just for talent and performance but for anybody who wants to <clears throat> it's it's divided into sections um so you can put post something there you'll send it to larry or me and we'll curate it make sure but if you want to tell a story about uh uh, anything or i think uh ricky steinberg sent me uh some mr levy's puns that he had found we'll post it <laughs> under there or some of the teachers so it's going to be a broad based but if anybody had is a poet or anything it's open to more than our class so we'll be looking for to do that but it's a peabody uh, uh channel that will anybody can contribute to uh, if you want to write a limerick or about me or something, you could do that, and uh, Larry will decide whether it's appropriate. So, okay, does anyone else have anything to add before we end? Okay, as always, this is wonderful. It warms my heart to do this. We'll be back next month. I feel like a TV announcer or something from uh, the old days of when we first started TVs, right? Most of us were born, there aren't TVs around. Uh, with Terry Cox, and then we're going to... Uh, Terry Pollock Cox, I, we always have to go go with your real name there. And then we'll be lining up, and some of you are, are hiding uh, that you need to get up here and, and, and do this. I, I'm gonna be bugging a few of you uh, because I know you have some things to say. And we'll be working through our class, and I think we might get through our class by the end of the year. And then uh, I know uh, Donna's sister's a poet and has some success, we'll probably have her up. and there's, some amazing other talent and Mark Tierno, I think you're on the line still. Uh, Mark has had an amazing career as a local actor and uh, Donna Hetrick and I had the privilege, um, I don't know Mark if you want to unmute yourself, a few years ago to the, go to the Mark Tierno night at the Pittsburgh Film Festival on Melwood Avenue near the old, old uh, Crescendo Club an amazing work of Mark of all his films and outtakes and, and things like that. Uh, so we're going to get Mark up next year. And, and Mark is maybe my longest lifelong friend because his mother and my mother went to grade school together. So, uh, and then Mark and I lived together when we were up in, in Chisel Street at my house. So, uh, so we're going to get Mark up soon. And, um, some other people, so it will be great. So anyone that wants to do this or has a suggestion from a Peabody grad, just email me and we'll try to get it rolling forward, okay? Cool. Okay, well, I wanna thank everybody and uh, uh, we'll see you in a month and we'll get that channel rolling. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Great job, thank you, Donna. everybody. Hi, Harry. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Good. It was Good wonderful. Good Thank to see you. you. It was great to play yeah. for everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. So, Larry, you should be able to just put this up from your computer, hopefully. Uh, yeah, I, you want me to hold here? I'll show you. Hold on, hold on right here. Come on in, Jill. <laughs> so, Terry, what, what date did you want to do? I forgot the email. Is it? You want to do a different date, right, than the second Monday, yeah. May I share the screen for a moment? Sure, absolutely. You're a co-host. You may share. Let me unmute. Okay. Yeah, are we still on, Bob? We're on the, on, the, yeah. The, yeah. Okay, so the, 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 are you seeing what I'm sharing? Yeah. The Peabody Variety yeah. Show. I see Pam, I see uh, Adria, I see a conversation with Sandy, I see Chuck, right. I see Michael. A, and it's divided up into some cat, like there's, yeah. there's, it's, I mean, there, here's, there's additional videos in here. There's uh, playlists. <laughs> Oh, there I am telling the story at the moth. Okay. Right. <laughs> we don't have any channels yet, and nobody's talked about anything because we haven't added any discussions yet. We can 
we can discuss discussions. <laughs> yeah, we may change the name from Variety Show, but what, what's oh, okay. the URL? That's, we can do that. Yeah, what's the URL, Larry? I forgot. Peabody or Highlander. What is it here? Uh, let's see. Wait, 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 wait. Well, I will send, be sending, but yeah, I, I'm thinking we want to make it broader than just. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to. I can't get. I got these boxes here. I got to figure no, out. No, that's how. okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. Oh, there you go. Okay. Yeah, but I think we can also make it a little. There's Mo too. Yeah, we make it a little broader to include things that aren't necessarily performing. Oh, okay, you know? okay, okay. Very yeah, good. Let me, can, let me, yeah, we'll, that. Let me turn this off. That. Yeah. Let me turn this off. Maybe Highlanders highlights oh. something like yeah, that. Yeah, something like that, or highlights and spotlights, odd. something like that. Yeah. Because that way, if people want to talk about a remembrance of a classmate or talk about something, yeah, yeah highlights or highlights, it that sounds good. That's yeah. good. Yeah. Terry, Terry, you must have been in PR. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a writer, and I'm yeah. a, yes, I'm a wordsmith, so I play with words. <laughs> yeah, I like highlights or highlights. That's a good one. Yeah. yeah. Write that. Write that down now. I wonder if this Hi, is a... Hi, Terry. <laughs> Good to see you. You too. <laughs> you look fantastic. <laughs> I like your glasses, too. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, it's great oh, to we see talking. everybody. Let's see. Yeah, thanks, thanks again for organizing this. And, and when are we going to do yeah. this, Terry? I forget. The yeah, that's day. what I was going to say. Monday the sixteenth. Okay, uh, that that should work. Let me make sure that. Does that work for you? Is that that's the following yeah. one? Yeah. Yeah, I'll be in Minnesota, but I don't think that's the problem. Yeah, if you want to schedule, you want. I mean, no, that's, that's I can work with your schedule anytime after the sixteenth or after is fine with me. Yeah, let's do. I, I let's do the sixteenth because. Okay. You know, we we do it the second or the third, and and okay. I'll be able to work with you on that. Um, okay. So I'll work with you because we always we always do a run through and try to you know call. And then um, they were able to edit. Um, Pam was having somebody edit. I don't know, Larry, if you if you can't have or can acquire the skills to edit the zooms, but that would be great if because they can be oh. edited. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I can probably. Yeah, I can, what, what would you like me to edit? Well, in, I don't know yet, your... but like some things, you maybe you know, there's some bumps in it. Or, oh, okay. Yeah, oh, dude, like like, uh, like just look it over. And, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, one thing would be good if we could do is find a way to put a filter on some of the sound. Because and I think there is a way to do that. Yeah. I don't know how, but I I'll, think I'll Michael can see if I can find yeah. something. Yeah. Be great. Okay, so uh, 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 we had Terry Cohen and Richie Robinson in, and we had uh, Pam. We had um, we went to Minios, and we spent a lot of time together with some classmates. Uh, so this is great. So that's the other thing that meetup yeah. section. So you, 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 have a, you have a video from Minios. Please. Not a video. We have, <laughs> we have still pictures. That's please, my please, question. That's good. You please. know what? I, I'll, I'll, I'll throw them together and turn them into like one of those uh, you know, little slideshow slide kind yeah. of movie thing. Okay. Because everybody wants to see pictures of videos almost as much as they want to eat it. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah, I just thought I was getting hungry for pizza. <laughs> yeah, right. I wonder why. <laughs> okay, so we'll do the 16th, uh, Terry. And when I okay, great. said, you know, I'll announce afterwards, and I think we'll be, you know, I'll work with you later this week, Larry, to see if the channel is polished enough after. I think okay, after the Cordillo is up, we have, what, six up yeah, already? Yeah, there's some stuff to watch. And, sure. and, and I'm, watch, I'm trying to get work with Donna to figure out where the recording of the reunion is. I thought I had it on my machine. She thought I had it on your, from what we did a year ago. Oh. Um, okay. well, so we'll find, figure this out. If you find yeah. it, put it in the Google. Uh, yeah, we will. We'll, the we'll, Google we'll Docs get, folder, and that'll be yeah. there. Yeah. Great. Good. 
And I don't, not sure why it's not on my computer. Donna looked at hers, but I might have to help her look. So we'll figure it out. Hope because yeah. we both recorded. Somewhere. Yeah, it's somewhere. So, okay, great. So I will talk to you all later, and talk to you later in the week, uh, Larry. Have a good, yeah. Have a good week. Talk to everybody later. Bye bye. 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 Good to see you, bye. Bye. Good to see you everyone. <laughs> good to see you. Let's see. I got to stop the recording. <laughs> yep. Great. Well, I...